Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming to the after lunch session. I know this is a, is a special one, so <laughs> um, I'll try to make this an interesting story. Yeah, so the, the talk today is called um, Hard Bits of Event-Driven Applications with Kafka and Restate. Um, I was thinking to not make this so much about actually ca Kafka and Restate as in um, you know, technologies and, and, and products per se, but actually try to, to tell it a little bit along this angle. Um, stream processing versus durable execution um, for event-driven analytics versus transactions. Um, let me maybe start this by just asking in the room. I've, uh, probably a lot of you here have heard the term stream processing before, right? Like this has been around for a bit. Um, should, be, should be by now some, somewhat recognized. Has anybody actually ever heard the term durable execution? Well, that's for people. That's not bad. It's, um, or workflows as code, anybody? OK, the same people. It makes sense. OK, good. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so the, um, the talk is a little bit about how stream processing and durable execution sort of are. Uh, the way I think about it, two sides of the same coin, with like different applications in the event-driven use case spectrum. And durable execution is, I think, the missing piece to make the remaining parts of event-driven applications actually easier. So let me start, start out a little bit like this. Um, Starting with, you know, if you're, if you're building event-driven applications, there's a large spectrum of, of applications folks build, like more analytical, more transactional. The analytical ones being typically aggregating many events, you know, running with, you know, seconds of latency is still pretty good there. Um, classical examples would be, you know, streaming, uh, data lakes, streaming warehouses, or even ETL, uh, CDC, materialized views, and so on. This is actually where I would say a lot of the focus uh, of technology over the last years has been, as, like at least the technology in the area of event-driven applications. There's frameworks like Flink, Kafka Streams, Materialize. They've actually made those types of use cases, I would say, relatively easy, like relatively convenient to build. Um, if you want to run really large-scale analytics, you just pick up one of those frameworks, and it takes care of all the hard parts for you. You don't need to worry about fault tolerance, about scalability, about correctness. Like This is basically, it's basically done. The same thing is actually quite true if you go to the other side of applications. And just to make, uh, to make clear, like what type of applications do I mean by these? Um, those are the applications where, uh, where you know, the parts of your application that, that do actually mutate the state, that update the different databases. Let's say you're running an e-commerce platform, and it's the part that runs the checkout process, that updates the product database and says, this one is sold. Then it updates like the logistics pipeline, says, you know, like start packaging this and sending it. Or if you're, if you're like a trading platform, the one that says, OK, you know, like the trade has been agreed, now actually push it through the settlement process and actually swap the assets and so on. This is often stuff that is important. So you don't just make like a transient uh, API call and say like, you know, go and do your thing. Usually you try to build it with events and message queues because you want the durability. You know, you want to be sure, you know, once I, once I start the checkout process, it really should actually go through and deliver the package. So I'm going to trigger this by a durable event in a queue, something like Kafka. But then everything that happens behind that is actually not, is actually not terribly easy. And the, so we're, we're always asking ourselves, like, what is actually the equivalent of, let's say, an Apache Flink for these type of applications? And I think the answer is there isn't really anything. The reason why there isn't really anything is that I think a good sort of general purpose abstraction for making those type of use cases uh, easy to handle hasn't actually been agreed upon so much yet. So the common denominator for those type of applications is, I think, something like the Kafka protocol, Kafka consumers, consumer groups. It's an extremely low-level primitive, but that, that seems to be the common denominator still with which most of these applications are built. Um, and the, and that, that is a very low-level primitive. I think that's what, what makes those types of event-driven applications still very, very hard to build, like compared to the analytical parts where you have all those powerful frameworks. The, Thesis of this talk, you can actually sum it up like this, is uh, I think durable execution is that missing piece. Durable execution is what stream processing is to event-driven analytics. Durable execution is going to be for like the more transactional um, form of, uh, of use cases. Think what stream processing is for the OLAP style world. Durable execution is for the OLTP world. And um, I think the remainder of this talk, I'm trying to you know, build up uh, in, into making a case for that. 
And then, you know, talking a little bit about restate later, which is like an implementation of a durable execution system. So, what, what makes those event-driven applications hard? Um, you know, we, we have Kafka, which is a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. You know, it has this nice, nice consumer group protocol. Um, you know, it balances across parallel consumers. It gives you the, you know, the ability to consume events that commit offsets. Um, shouldn't that be good? You can just like commit a, a consume an event and say, you know, let's, let's push this into a database or even to, to multiple, multiple databases. Um, like in theory, that sounds good, but in practice, you're just going to stumble across so many things that make this actually not, not that easy, where you start to introduce a lot of plumbing around it. Um, and they're very, very simple things, like you know, you're actually talking to a database that might be a little slower to respond. Maybe only one out of five times it's really slow, but that already kills like, your event-driven pipeline, um, because you get these like, famous head-of-the-line waiting effects. I don't know. If, if for, for some of you folks, I've talked to lots of Kafka folks for who head of the line waiting was like a, a, whenever they heard it, they got like an internal panic. They had so much, um, so much fun experience with that over the time. Um, let's say you're building an application and you're building against again uh, against an eventually consistent system. And what you need to do um, is maybe delay an event because the system isn't ready to accept it yet. And you start introducing custom state and time and you know durability layer just to be able to take an event out of the pipeline, delay it to process it later. Joining events, okay. Um, maybe you just have different event pipelines that deliver p uh, different bits of the information, and all of a sudden you're, you know, you know, you're back to stream processing, even though you'd actually just wanted to you know, combine two different topics. If you call multiple downstream APIs and you really want to make sure this runs in a consistent way, are you kind of back to pulling in something like Kamunda or so, a full workflow engine? And those are, those are things you actually hit almost immediately once you're building non-trivial event-driven applications. And let me just guide a little bit like step by step through some of the examples like if you know let's let's build simple sort of event driven services and and see how they how they behave and you know what what can we do about this let's take the the simplest one this is um we're just consuming from a kafka topic and and we want to um we want to call a service for each event let's say that's um Let's say it's an, it's an event that represents a certain you know, like update to user service or, or verifying a user. It comes through a you know, through durable queue like Kafka because it's an important thing that we want to make that happen. And then we, you know, we call it to that target service. Um, we've written this in the simplest possible way here. That's just a utility function. What it really does is instantiate a Kafka consumer, uh, pull a few batches, um, and then you know, execute that action, namely make an HTTP call to that specific service. So that service has the characteristic that it you know, takes a few hundred milliseconds sometimes to process um, a request. You know, sometimes it's a little faster, sometimes it's a little slower. So if we run this, you know, Kafka can give you usually thousands of events per second. But if you actually run this, it's immediately not looking great, right? Like because we're, you know, we have some like a highly asynchronous um, you know, system like Kafka pushing us events, then we're doing synchronous calls to a downstream system. Immediate mismatch, right, between slow synchronous sort of request response and the whole asynchronous event-driven world. Now you could say, okay, this is an easy example. Let me just like in my consumer log like, open a thread pool. I'm just going to throw out like all these um, calls and like multiple threads. Yeah, if you you may want to introduce a little more because if you want to preserve the order per key and so on, you actually want to make sure that the events like per thread you know, stay ordered. Also, you have to think about the fact, when do you actually now commit the offsets back to Kafka because you're taking out a whole bunch, throwing this out to the APIs, and at some point, you need to sort of commit the whole bunch. What's the right point to do it? Do you just like do that in batches? Do you try to like, you know, pipeline this, have overlaying batches? Like it immediately becomes actually way harder than, than it might, might have actually uh, sounded initially. I think in Flink, we built this, what's called the asynchronous IO operator for en enrichment with other services. And that thing alone was like multiple thousand lines of code in the end until it was really like super robust and consistent, everything, and had actually custom state management in there. So something as simple as that, you know, I'm just taking events from Kafka and, and, and sending it against an API that's maybe not super fast. It's already, it's already not, not a super easy, um, super easy experience. Let's actually try and, and show you what this looks like in a durable execution system. And um, I'm going to you know, leave a few things open here and, and fill in the gaps, actually, as we come. Let me see if I, if I started everything. Should be all there. OK. So um, in a durable execution system, something like this might, might look just, 
just like that part. Let me actually make this larger again. Okay, so we just have, we're basically writing event handlers. We're, we're writing not actually uh, manual consumers, we're writing event handlers. Um, we're getting one here, like ignore the object context and so on for a second. Uh, this is going to come in a bit. The only thing we're going to do is actually say, what do we want to do with this event, right? So we're getting the key here from the context, and then we're doing the, the call execute. That's it. Um, so in some way, it's kind of a more push-based model than a pull-based model. That's, that's the first bit, and you know, like the remaining bits, how they connect together. Uh, bear, bear with me for a second. So let's actually, um, let's actually connect this and see, see how that bit goes. OK, that immediately goes much faster, right? So there's apparently a lot of sort of asynchrony parallelism there in the way that, that allows us to say, you know, you know, while one event is still in progress, um, giving me the response, the other ones are happening. The system is actually, you know, the durable execution engine is actually going to take care of you for like preserving key orders, even if you have um, if you have the same uh, key going to to the APIs. Um, but you know, what, what's really what's really the big difference here? Let me go back to the slides for a second. So one of the first things to notice that's actually different here is is really the model pull versus push. Um, this is this is something that we're going to come back through um, throughout the talk. Um, Kafka has this model where you have uh, the, the broker partitions, you have consumers, consumers form a consumer group, and then they pull. Um, they pull from that queue. And that's actually a great model, I think, for analytics, where you pull large budgets, uh, badge, badges and where you have somewhat more heavyweight, long-lived processes that run the analytics that want to do this. It's a very, a very sort of performance-optimized model, I would say. Um, a throughput optimized model, let's put it like this, throughput optimized model for slow changing resources. But it's, it's not really good at dealing with, you know, like other, other um, you know, integration with other systems, specifically these type of situations where, you know, you have actually delays in your processing path. So the, the way that, you know, a so system like Reset or durable execution in general would work is it actually says, OK, we're starting um, entirely with a push model, right? We're not trying to actually put the processing into like sticky consumer groups, but we're trying to really make them as fine-grained handlers. And we're letting the system push invocation into our handlers. Um, we can actually let the system be clever and say, you know, it understands what, what you know, push messages are still being processed, haven't been acknowledged, so it's going to hold off the ones for the key for a bit later, and then push them once it's there. And that, you know, that immediately gives you a whole bunch of benefits that I think are are very, very nice for transactional applications. The first one is, you know, if one of these functions takes a little longer, it doesn't actually interfere with the other ones. The push model, incidentally, just like works amazing with modern cloud infrastructure. You can put the code onto something like AWS Lambda or so, and you immediately get an auto-scaling, scale to zero system without doing anything about it. Um, let's just, just leave it here for a second and, and go to the next bit. So one of the Maybe one of the takeaways here is I think the, the very raw Kafka model, the pull model, I think a great model for analytics, I think for, for, um, for more flexible transactional workloads, you probably want a, a push model that is slightly more, you know, more lightweight. Let's get a, go to the second part. Um, well, let's actually stay with slides just for a second. Uh, code that updates multiple systems. Um, let's assume the next kind of application that we want to develop is one where um, you know, we're assigning a new role to a user, which means we have to update a, a permissions profile. Um, again, you know, if we kind of promote a user to uh, be that admin super user or something like this, it's probably a sensitive operation that we you know, want to trigger with a durable event, because it, it should actually happen. And it, it consists of, let's say it consists of multiple steps here, right? Like we're creating a new role, then we're applying, assi uh, assigning a set of partitions to that role, and then we're assigning the role to the user. Each of these individual steps is actually fairly easy in the sense of if I, you know, if it fails in the middle and I just try it, no harm done, right? I might create another empty role, that's fine. If I apply a set of permission twice to the roles, the same permission, no, hurt, no uh, worries. If I assign that role to the user um, multiple times, also okay. Like each step is idempotent. But the thing we really need to take care of is that by the time we created the role and assigned it to the user and then we crash, um, we don't want to create another role and assign it to the user and actually give them like double super user permissions or so. And you know, if you remove one role, you, you, you might overlook that it still has the super user permissions from the other role. Like these are the type of situations you want to avoid. So let's say every step needs to at least make sure that the previous one, it sees a consistent result from the previous one. 
I would say in my previous life, and we were building Flink, this would have been sort of intuitively how I would have thought about it. Let's actually build it stream processing, right? Like we make each of these steps um, a streaming transformation, and then we write the downstream result into a queue and build the next one and write a queue and you know to the next one. It kind of works. It's just a little more work to do. And like especially if you if you don't want to pull in a heavyweight stream processing framework. So the intermediate steps give you the durability. And um, yeah, the you know, your progress in the workflow kind of implicitly depends on where is an event in which queue is it. Let's say we have a user Knuth that we're pushing through that workflow, we're trying to assign it the permissions and for some reason, Knuth hasn't actually gotten all the permissions, and we're trying to figure out where it is. What it actually boils down to is we're searching through all the queues, and we're, we're trying to figure out, OK, in which queues the Knuth event, like what parts did he complete, what parts did he not complete. So OK, it's not great for observability, but you can kind of, kind of make it happen. OK, here's a, here's a different way we can look at this. And this is sort of like one of the absolute gists of how durable execution works. We can say we take this code. We just write it down as sequential code. And as we run through it, we journal all the individual steps. So we need some form of durability between each steps. But instead of saying we're like taking an event, transforming it, writing an event, let's say we're actually running actions, and we journal the results of actions. So you know, as the function apply role update is called, think of that as being our event handler here. Um, we have like we can sort of run sub steps and say, you know, make the result of that step durable. So this is you know, it's taking an event, persisting it. Hey, the role that I created, uh, the ID is A77. I, I assigned the first permission. Um, let's assume I crash now, you know, big bang. And, um, and then it retries. And what happens is it actually executes the function again. But it, it has the journal from the last execution. It replays everything it had so far, and then basically goes from there and applies the remaining steps. That is actually not too unlike stream processing in the way as you know, we write events. But one way you can think about it is where stream processing, it's kind of like you take this code and you roll it out. You do it like one step after the other and put a queue between every step. Right? In this case, what we actually do is we don't roll out the code into like a linear sequence, but we actually say we're kind of keeping a journal on the side into which we write. Like it's almost like we have a lightweight write ahead log in the background. Um, so the, the interesting bit about this is, like, aside from the fact that it's much more compact to write, it also gives you the ability to, to do like, dynamic control flow. One of the things that's really tricky about stream processing uh, is you always need to know up front what the sequence of your steps is going to be, right? because you're building the, the stream processing graph out of it. Here, you're basically running code. It can have sort of dynamic control flow. It's fairly easy. Um, the, the whole execution is actually, um, let me actually skip here. Let me actually go to this one. The whole execution is, is still n kind of related to the whole, like how event-driven applications, are how stream processing works in the, in the following way, right? Like we're, instead of, instead of writing downstream into nodes, what we're writing is we're writing sort of nested queues or nested journals into, into the original queue. So think of the example again as we're creating the role, applying the permission, all the events that represent the completion of that stage, they kind of get attached to the original event as a subjournal. The way this is actually implemented, at least in our, in our system, is it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a, a, a log, similar to Kafka, that you append to, but then there's some sort of asynchronous process that indexes this into like an event and subjournal relationship. So instead of saying we can just publish into stream down into queues downstream what we can actually do is we can we can sort of enrich the queue or the events in the queue uh, out of which we're executing and um, let me just show you how this how this looks in practice there's a few really nice properties about that um, aside from the fact of how easy it looks so this is literally all that we need to do in order to build this in a durable execution system um, handle profile event, we run the first step here, um, you know, creating the role, applying the permission. Here we're just applying one permission. I didn't do the loop because it you know, serves the purpose also without. Um, and then we're applying the update. So I don't actually have a Kafka equivalent, a pure Kafka equivalent for that, because that is actually a pretty, pretty, pretty big thing to, to develop. But um, yeah, so this is, this is really how, like, all we need. And um, I mentioned something about observability earlier. So let me actually show you also what's really nice about observability if you use a system like this. Um, one moment. Let me start this one in the debugger instead. And then we can, can, 
can even go and do a few, a few, you know, debugging steps. Oh, well, we're way too fast here. Um, Okay, um, let, let's assume we, you know, we want to do exactly that case. We have a user that is stuck somewhere in the, um, that is stuck somewhere in, in the processing. Good. We can, um, yeah, we can let this run for a bit, but we'll, you know, we'll hit this breakpoint relatively soon. Okay, hey, you know, we're, we're breaking the program basically here in the in the third step. You know, we're we're just assuming this user is getting stuck, and we're simulating this by running this in the debugger with a breakpoint. Um, you know, let, let's try to see how we can find out what's up with that user. That user is called Ronald60. Okay, uh, good. Copy value. So one of the things we can actually do is we can we can ask this system here just um, something like. Okay, from all your like durable execution events that you have published, um, we just have one single queue. Remember that we're sort of putting everything in, even if we're organizing this in journals or in events and subjournals. We can, we really have only this one queue that we have to search for. So we can just say, okay, hey, you know, what is um, is there something for for the key Ronald sixty in there? And it tells us, yeah, I have something in there. It's it's one invocation that is going on. Um, okay, for fifty six seconds, great. By the way, here's the identifier of that invocation. Good. Um, let's actually ask this one, okay, where, where in your whole progress are you? Because, you know, you have all the events that correspond to the durable execution. Can you actually show us how many you have collected? And I'm not sure how, how well you can see this, but you can see at the bottom here exactly that it tells us, okay, we've completed the event for create side, uh, create side effect, um, create roll update, and the side effect apply permissions, and the, the third one is running. So it tells us exactly, hey, yeah, you're here. You're stuck in the third place, in the, in the third one. Like trying to imagine building something like this for a general purpose stream processing framework where you have to sort, like, sort and search through all the intermediate Kafka partitions. It's kind of, it's kind of daring. Um, and because you know we're not actually rolling this out into multiple queues, we're all keeping it together in this journal. It makes it very easy in our case here. Good. Let's actually go back to. Let's actually unblock this. Uh, I'll just start it outside the debugger again, and let it continue. Good. Let's actually go to slides once more. All right. So, um, so far for you know systems that update uh, or events that update multiple systems, let's let's try to do something something even more brutal. Let's try to. This is a real use case that we've uh, that we've actually seen folks use uh, durable execution for, specifically because it's so hard to do um, to do other other solutions. Let's actually deal with unprocessable events or events that we can't process right now. Um, I can. Go to the Kafka example first. The the use case we have is is an eventually consistent system. So we're um, we're making a call to the user update service, and sometimes the service tells us, okay, the user is busy, like somebody else is modifying the profile and so on. You know, I can't actually accept the change right now. Need to you know process those changes before I can accept that event and do the update because otherwise you're like overriding an intermediate situation. Um, so the way we're implementing this is we're basically saying sleep 2,000 milliseconds and then try again. You know we're pulling this. Let's actually try to run this the manual way, and you can probably imagine what happens. It is brutal. So we're going to get a few events, you know, that that are processed, and then we're going to hit one that you know hits this. You know the downstream system isn't yet there, so we need to do something about it. And you would need to. You'd almost have, you have a way more extreme case of the first scenario now, right? You need to go and say, I cannot process that event now. I need to sort of put it back, like put it back in the queue. It's not so easy. Uh, let me try and not acknowledge the offset. But what do you do with all the other events that you process, right? So you kind of have to take it out of the queue, maybe put it in a special queue, in a process later queue. You have to kind of do that recursively, because the next time you try it might not actually work either. Um, you, you really... Yeah, you might put it in a database and put a timer there and say, like, you know, look at that event later. It, it becomes a, a pretty big task in plumbing. And, um, you know, what we really want, though, is the ability to write the application logic 
in that exact simple way. Like that is what I would absolutely love to write. So let's actually look at the durable execution example again, which, funny enough, looks exactly like that. So we're, you know, we're getting the event. We're trying to make the update. Um, if we see user busy, we're basically sleeping, and then we're running this again until it works. If we if we do execute that bit now, let me actually connect the third subscription here, and go back here. It runs it runs pretty well, right? Like, and the the reason is um, kind of similar as the first one. First of all, we have a push model, so even if one bit takes a little longer. Um, it's not a problem, but it goes actually further than that. So I met a sleep here for two seconds. Two seconds is really just for the sake of demo. Right? That's not very representative. I think the, for the ones that we work with, that they usually wait for an hour before they do that again. You don't actually want an event handler to just like wait for an hour, especially if you run this on Lambda or something like this. What you really want is basically go away and come back after an hour and, and try it again then. Wouldn't it be nice, though, if you could still write it like this? And, and, and funny enough, you can. Because what actually happens when you do a sleep in, in durable execution is you're actually putting an event again in your journal, and it says, you know, I got nothing to do until that particular timestamp. So the durable execution broker that pushes that event can actually just cancel the execution and say, you know, if you have nothing to do right now until in an hour, let me actually just cancel you and let me basically trigger a recovery in an hour, and then you make progress. So what you're actually doing here is you're writing a sleep, but you're not actually getting a sleep. You're getting a cancellation and a retry later. So it's kind of... You call it a durable sleep. And, and that actually means you can write these type of event handlers that look like they run actually for months, when they really just execute for a few milliseconds and sleep most of the time in between. And um, like again, this is, this is a very useful, useful primitive, especially if you're dealing with like a lot of eventually consistent systems. And I dare everyone just make the mental exercise of trying to build this on a Kafka consumer manually. It's, it's doable, but you, it's not a weekend project. It's, it's, it's going to be a, a full sprint <laughs> until, you've, until you've built this. So, um, OK, let's take maybe the final bit um, before we go more into the, yeah, OK, this is what I just explained. So the, yeah, just as a recap, the, the idea here really is durable execution is it's kind of a higher level tool. Think of it as is, is the, the stream programming for transaction, uh, the stream processing for transactional applications, right? It's not the, you have the low level storage primitive, the log, the consumers. You use that to build more high level tools on top of Kafka streams, Flink, and so on for the analytical side, durable execution for the transactional side. So this is really the stack that I would assume is going gonna, is gonna to come out. Um, as this, as this technology matures. You have storage, you know, I think Kafka's a pretty strong protocol there. And then you have stream processing and durable execution for those two different, different sides. And you can think OLAP and OLTP, really. OLAP and OLTP in the event-driven world. One is stream processing, the other is durable execution. Let's, let's do one final thing, and that is try to implement sort of a sequential request response pattern in an event-driven application. Assume you have something that is triggered by an event, um, you're processing it, but you also need to call another service. You want to make this like fully reliable, asynchronous, so you're, you're really doing it again like, with queues and everything. And um, it's, it's a fairly elaborate thing, because you actually have to write a state machine now on the sender, as in, OK, I've received the event, I've sent out the other thing, I'm waiting for a response, let the response come in. It's actually the simple version of the state machine. If you have additional requirements, again, like preserving order per key, what actually happens is that you have to Again, hold back events for the same key until you've, re uh, until you've finished processing the request response. And um, again, the answer in durable execution is actually fairly simple for this, because you're writing literally that bit. So you're, you know, you're taking an event, you can do the first part of the processing logic, and what you're doing is you're calling the other service almost as if it is you know, another RPC service, and you're awaiting it. And it, it basically takes care of like sending it through a queue, receiving it through a queue. And the most important bit of the other service takes two days to respond. Again, you don't want to keep this one up waiting, right? You want this one to be able to go away and to recover and to come back. And this is, um, this is something that um, durable execution actually gives you, gives you as well. The ability to, to sort of understand um, that these calls are made, that there is a future, a promise waiting for the response, that this is part of the journal, that this is restored from the journal and reconnected um, as you recover. 
So those are, are typical patterns that are, are fairly, easy, um, fairly easy to build. In a way, you can think of durable execution gives you the ability to build event-driven without necessarily thinking in events, or asynchronous programming without necessarily thinking about asynchronous events and queues, but really thinking about durable function, durable promises. Um, let me actually take a few minutes to just go into, into Reset as like our implementation of durable execution. It's, uh, it's not the only one. Um, it's the one, it, it's a particularly good one, I think, and it's the one that I'm going to present here today. So, um, so the way you can think of Restate is it's a sort of almost system on a chip style deep integration of a, of a log with a durable execution state machine, a state engine, a, a timer engine. Right? We actually chose that anal analogy quite on purpose because it's a very different philosophy with which we've built compared to, for example, how we've built Flink, which is like, you know, first of all, you want to do the terabyte use cases. Here, we first of all, want to do the really like, lightweight, extremely lightweight, tight integration between those properties. And um, I, I mostly said durable execution right now. What, what, the, what it really is is if it's a few things coming together, durable execution being the sort of workflow as code, the journaling, the, re, um, the restoring of the journaling, there's a concept called virtual objects in there, which you can think of as the equivalent of like stateful stream processing. So virtual objects to durable execution, you can think of it as stateful stream processing to stateless stream processing. It's not quite correct because durable execution itself has also some amount of state, but it's like the explicit sort of you know, key value state that you might know from stateful stream processing. And then durable futures promises is just it's a cool extension to it, which is um, basically the thing that allows us to do like RPCs and webhooks and everything in a way that you just define a future task. Um, the, f the, the tasks uh, can be like call an RPC, do whatever, and it basically just creates um, a promise, a coroutine for you in the, in the code. It persists that one, and whenever something crashes and recovers in a different process, it just wires everything back together as if it didn't fail before. Um, you can actually use that to just, you know, make certain certain workflows, um, or you know, like RPC handlers, workflow style durable execution, uh, robust. But a really cool way to use it is, I think, in this combination with Kafka, where you can think of Kafka is the the event storage, the long-term durable event storage, you know, the thing that is the infinite buffer that accepts and stores your events forever, and that also has pop-stub style. I didn't have that on the, have, don't have that on the slide, but it has the pop-stub style capabilities of having, you know, multiple consumers for the event stream. What Restate really is, you can think of that as like it's a durable event dispatch that adds the ability to use durable execution out of order processing, state timers, promises, and everything in the handling of your events. Um, and you can actually see this, I think, very, very much in the designs of these systems. They're built fundamentally different. Um, abstraction for, for Restate is durable handlers. For Kafka, it's consumer groups. It's a push-based model in Restate versus a pull-based model. Um, I said that before. I really believe that, that there is something there. The pull-based model from Kafka is, I think, a good one for like, these high-throughput analytical use cases. I think if you want to wire up a modern, like, highly dynamic cloud infrastructure or microservice infrastructure, you actually want a push-based model to connect it. Um, and yeah, Reset doesn't actually build this infinite retention at the moment that Kafka builds. It uses a very unique kind of internal architecture with virtual queues per key versus coarse grained partitions. Um, and yeah, it adds the sort of durable execution state time RPC capabilities on top of that. Let me actually just show you one thing um, real quick if we have a few minutes left, how far you can actually take how far you can actually take this durable execution paradigm if you want to. Just need to bring up a different, um, different demo setup real quick. Let me actually see. Okay, while this one is coming up, this takes a moment. I'm going to go in, uh, into explaining a little bit what we're, what we're going to see here. Um, this actually needs like internet and so on to do a bit of like <laughs> on the on demand code compilation. So let's see if that actually works. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work, we go straight to questions and conclusion. Um, the, the scenario I want to show here is it's a small sort of like microservice application that does, you know, DoorDash, Vault, Fudora style. 
um, style demo. You know, you have um, you have customers that place orders, they come in through a queue. You have drivers that go and deliver. They actually send their GPS pings and the updates from their apps also through a queue. And you have the, the workflow that processes the order, just the payment, up to, talks to the restaurant. You have you know, the driver pool, driver matchmaking. You have a digital twin for the driver. You can actually implement all this in an extremely easy way um, with durable execution. This is all, you know, we want to build this reliable, so we want to build this like in an you know, event-driven way. Um, but we don't necessarily want to deal with all the hassle of, of retries, of state machines, um, of everything manually. So here's what we, here's what we get out of, uh, here's how we built this. Okay, let me, okay, the window crashed. Anyways, you can see the most important bits on the, on the screen as they are. This is really what um, the order processing workflow looks like in its, in its core. Um, it's really just the sequence of steps. You know, we're creating a token. We're calling the payment processor. Um, we're updating the status service in the, in the mean in the middle. We're doing like a durable sleep here um, to say how long you know how long you need to um, delay the order if you're uh, placing an order for for later. And um, and that's it. We're basically just. We're basically, um, we're basically just writing the happy path. You can almost think of we're just writing down the happy path of things, and we're relying on the durability and the durable promises and execution to wire everything together. And you know, if everything came out correctly, what we should see here is, is, an, is an application that just allows us to, to do things. OK, we have a delivery in progress. Um, well, we can actually do just for the fun of it. Um, say, you know, let's actually test the durability layer a little bit. So. So actually just say we kill this app in the middle. Um, the, that is actually one, one container that runs all the microservices um, just for simplicity in this uh, Docker Compose setup. So let's actually just kill this thing here. Um, what we should see now is that the delivery stops, of course, right? Because our microservices in the back end are down. Like at least we don't see the progress anymore. Um, let's bring this back up. And we should see that it continues. Great. OK. Um, that is pretty much it. The one thing I want to stress is if you actually look at the code, um, the code is online. Um, if you go to reset dev examples, end to end examples, you'll not see a single like offset management, transaction management, like queue, anything in there. It's just like you're writing down sequential code as if you're on the happy path. You can kill anything at any point in time. You just like start it, it wires back together, it goes. So this is really the. This is really the idea or the promise of durable execution. Let me just put that slide here um, because I think it sums it up. I think it's the other side of the coin compared to stream processing for the transactional versus analytical world. And yeah, with that, let me conclu conclude the talk. And if we have time, happy to take a question or two still. We do have one question online, Stefan. He says, uh, what are the main differences between temporal.io and restate? Yeah, so that's, that's actually a great question. Durable execution um, is something, the, the first system I think that sort of came up with this term is, is temporal, so it's probably the one that people would know the best right now. I think temporal falls short on, a, on, on actually using durable execution in many ways. So tem temporal basically uses, if you wish, the first bits of durable execution, just journaling um, and, and replay. Um, what is completely missing, I think, in, in Temporal is connecting it to event-driven applications, connecting it, like doing state management, doing the, the distributed like durable promises that actually allow you to do very easy signaling RPC style um, applications. I think you need this for this whole thing to come together. So I would say like Temporal, great first mover in that place. But I think they're missing a few things. That is number one. Um, they're just missing a few ingredients to really make it work in the, in the general beyond workflows and a general microservice setup. And the second one is, um, is actually this bit. Like you can, you can think like reset is a single binary. It's a few tens of megabytes large, written in Rust. You actually start it. It's there. 
Um, it has everything, everything you need. It's extremely easy to operate. You put it on EBS volume, you probably don't have to look at it again for a very long time. Um, it's a very different experience with Temporal, I think. Like it's a Cassandra class, an Elasticsearch cluster, and this, and then the worker queues, and so on. It's like you can actually see you know, Temporal was built in the way that we built Flink in the first generation. You know, like first the Ubers and the Netflixes, and then the sort of average app developer. With Reset, we're taking the opposite way. Like the first thing is make it an extremely lightweight, deeply integrated thing, very easy to run, and then you know, scale it as you you know, scale a, scale a, uh, a system, um, a computer. You know, it should work simply as a single computer and then you scale it as a data center. You don't build a data center first and then sh try to shrink it to computer size. I think that's kind of the other philosophical difference. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. All right, there's more questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here for a bit. Thank you.